Our second scripture reading this morning is from the book of Matthew's, the Beatitudes reading. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so men persecuted the prophets who were before you. Peace. It's quite the spiritual fruit um, to have for a week like this week. I want to start a little bit farther back um, as fall has come and we're a month away from Thanksgiving. Um, and it places me at our farm in Ohio. Um, and where we um, gather together the whole Murphy side of the family um, every Thanksgiving, and we have the feast that's amazing that so many families have, and that's one of the times out of the year that I actually run and actually want to run because I need something to help that belly. Um, and in one of those runs, my dad and uncles, who are the runners of the family, along with one of my sisters, um, took us on a trail that they used to go through as little boys growing up, and that was out in the wheel fields um, and cornfields. So we're running through um, and the cornfields haven't been totally removed so there are corn stalk stubbles everywhere and frozen ice little um, puddles. Um, I hate running now even on Thanksgiving. Um, I really thought I was going to twist an ankle. I thought I was going down. I hate wet feet. My feet were soaked and they were freezing. I was not happy. It was not fun, um, but I was doing it. But let me tell you, I will never forget the moment I hit the paved road back to the farmhouse. I also don't think I've ever run so fast in my entire life. I felt so free. Like, my ankles were okay. I knew I wasn't going to step in another puddle. I had this awesome firm foundation, and I was ready to go. And it was the most delicious feeling I have encountered, and it is something that I can never forget. And I want us to hold that in terms of how we think about peace and how we think of the moments that cup up in our lives that are anything but peaceful. We turn to Las Vegas and we think of peace in Las Vegas. I was actually ready to talk with us today um, in accordance with what we're working in Financial Peace University and how to withstand marketing and where we really look for our peace. Is it something that money can provide? Um, or not. And, and to a certain extent, I want us to understand that I'm not talking about survival here. I'm not talking about the bottom end of Maslow's hierarchy. Um, and, and I know that the world doesn't have the shelter and the food and the resources that it needs for even that basic level. But for the conversation today, I want us to assume that we have that basic level met and that we're looking in terms higher up the pyramid of personal fulfillment and of whole peace. And how do we hold our center in terms of all of the marketing that happens and where does our peace come from? Back in Lent, we had a prayer of confession last season of how easy it is to get caught up in our worry and our anxiety about the few who have more than us. And why can't we just have that too? Or if we just had this or did this, then we would be happier and life would be better. 
and being caught up in that instead of the worry and concern about the many who have less, about those who don't even have that survival basic need met. And, and in talking about that, um, David Ramsey raises research from the book called Affluenza, haha, <laughs> influenza, affluenza, and the disease that has caught us and that can hold us captive. And in that research um, says that the average consumer is hit with 3,000 commercial messages a day. 3,000 messages of what will give us peace, of what will bring us happiness, of what will make our lives. For kids, um, before they reach 20, they will be hit with 1 million commercials. And if we add this up um, to all the years together over an average lifetime, it would be the equivalent of watching two straight years of television commercials. So the bombardment is real. Did you know, I didn't know this, did you know that um, the average that's spent on a 30-second national TV commercial is $300,000? That the average cost of one of those commercials is $10,000 per second? Put that with an episode of your favorite show that, you know, the new seasons have started. And one second for one episode of a TV show would cost an average of $83 versus the 10000 of the commercial. Um, there's a report in Forbes um, in 2012 over how Target does its um, marketing um, and how it assigns a guest ID that's attached to your credit card um, that um, basically creates a bucket to gather all of your information, name, email, any demographic information you've given, and your purchase history. Um, and they have a statistician um, by the name of Andrew Poole who uses all of those information buckets um, to find patterns and establish patterns. Um, and has done so to the point where um, Target can predict what trimester you are in um, based on the purchases that you have made. And that rug that was that certain color, oh, it's probably going to be a baby boy, so now we can send you gender-specific ads targeted at each stage of your pregnancy. Um, and what was talked about um, was a dad in Minneapolis um, going to the target manager in outrage because they had sent an ad with a pregnant um, woman um, to his high school daughter. It's saying, are you trying to get my daughter pregnant? Like, what is this? Um, and it turns out that she was pregnant. Um, and Target was able to predict that from consumer patterns before the family even knew. Marketing is real. And if we look at the intensity that comes our way and what we are asked to consume and what we are um, brought to and led to, um, we think about all of those averages and then we think of a place Las like Las Vegas that's built for entertainment, that's built for this and how all of this immediately goes to steroids. And not to steroids, but just goes on steroids, gets amped up and concentrated even more. And um, in terms of the marketing and in terms of finding peace, um, there's a lot of messages around gambling and the lottery, um, and our United Methodist um, belief has a very strong thing to say in terms of our book of discipline, calling gambling a menace to society, deadly to the best interests of moral, social, economic, and spiritual life. How it feeds on human greed and invites persons to place their trust in possessions rather than God and looking at our first commandment of having no other God before the Lord our God. And in relating with compassion and love to our brothers and sisters, we are called to resist those practices and the systems that exploit them and leave our brothers and sisters impoverished and demeaned. In Scripture, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 9 through 10, calls to us those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. 
for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Now I know I have friends and family who have those really good David Ramsey budgeting practices in place where we all get our pocket money and we're not overspending a budget and we get this to go and have some fun. And I don't want to be the person up here that stands and is like, thou shalt not have any fun. That's not a Ten Commandment. That's not a part of the Beatitude. But we are called to be makers of peace. And even if we are doing something that isn't harming ourselves, we are perpetuating a system that is harming others. And that is something that we are called to take into account. But today, Las Vegas and gambling and the love of money and all of the marketing ties and polls and that are a part of our consumeristic culture have taken a turn this week in the violence that was poured out in Las Vegas. And so now we come praying in a different way, remembering a different commandment to not kill, remembering a different beatitude, our blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And today we find in Las Vegas other stories and other truths as well. As we look, as Matt said, for the ones who are helping, who can reshape and reform our understanding of how we are called to be peacemakers and how the kingdom of God will come that much closer. And so we turn to Jonathan Smith, um, who is a 30-year-old dad who is at the concert with his three nieces, um, who got them out of the way and then turned back, as he um, tells in the interview, not being able to explain why he turned back, but seeing other people being trampled in the stampede of people running to the exit and how he turned back to help them get up and get to safety. Um, the... Um, Social media and others are accrediting him with saving a dozen, two dozen to 30 lives. He says he thinks it's only 15 to 20. Regardless, um, before he was shot, he was there helping others escape the violence. He was there as a peacemaker. And in his interview, um, he says that he's tired of people calling him a hero, that he doesn't understand himself as a hero. He understands himself just someone that just basically decided, you know what, I'll put someone's life before my own. We are all faced with decisions of how we will handle conflict and how we will handle disaster every day. And as peacemakers, I hope that we can have the courage to see the needs of the many, to see the needs of others beyond ourselves. This is what scripture calls us to. This is what it means to be a follower of God and of Jesus Christ. In our Hebrew scripture reading, these commandments um, of how to live together peacefully and honoring each person came in a wilderness time when the people had nothing, when they were grumbling just desperately trying to find that basic survival level of food to make it through. So we are called to be makers of peace in wilderness. As we just sung, when there's pain when the road is dark and marked with suffering. Just as we are called to be makers of peace when everything is as it should be. In the New Testament, the context changes, but not, not the content of the context. Because now here is Jesus speaking to people and how to live peacefully together in an occupied territory where they don't have the power to decide for themselves and how they will use their money. Where Rome is taxing them beyond, again, the basic needs of survival. And where they are trying to find a way forward in a place, in an empire, 
that is doing everything it can to not leave any room for them. There's a book by author Kristen Hanna called The Nightingale that explores what it is to be a maker of peace. Its setting is occupied France during World War II and how two different sisters live out that call in a family and how those around them decide to live out that call. I find stories really helpful when it comes to things like this because it gives us just enough separation and difference that we can go outside of ourselves and open up to creativity and thought and reflecting in a way that just doesn't happen when we're right in the middle of it. And Kristen Hanna's writing is incredible and beautiful. And she presents the characters in a way that helps us to see the grays beyond the black and white of evil good and to show the decisions that are made in everyday living on the most basic of levels. So when a Nazi comes to live in your house in occupied France, will you be a part of the community that resists or will you see that they have the power and do everything that you can to collude with them at the expense of your neighbors that you have lived with for years upon years. If you are the Nazi in power and doing the occupation, will you be the one that does so and risks himself and warning of what is going to happen for the woman's friend who is Jewish? that who lives with you? Or will you bring food so that her daughter doesn't starve? Or will you be the one that grabs power with both hands and abuses that power every second in every possible scenario that comes available in body um, and in spirit? We all have choices that we make and how we live and how we live into the spiritual fruit of peace. I was visiting with Florence this week um, and was asking her about her connection for Epworth and what she saw in Epworth and, and what success and what her dream of Epworth would look like. And she immediately responded with everyone doing their part. How do we be a family? How do we be disciples? where everyone does their part. Violence is going to come. Ways, roads marked with suffering will be present. The difference is going to be in how we do our cleanup work along the way and how we practice and how we learn from our mistakes and how we change and how we remain present with one another. And that is something that we can practice every moment of every day because for better or for worse, life is our gym. Life is our cornfield and there will be moments where it's really hard and we can stop running and give up and go home in a huff or we can do the training together with family and know what it feels like to hit the road with even more power than you've ever experienced because you did the training in the hard place. And so as a United Methodist Church, we are called to respond to the hard place of gun violence that is affecting our communities today. The American Medical Association has um, deemed this uh, health crisis um, after the attack in Orlando, Florida. And their research shows that 30,000 people, including children, die each year from gun violence. That is not including those who are injured. And so part of our 2016 General Conference of Methodists all around the world was a call to end gun violence. For those who are having trouble with the fear that this kind of violence will raise. There's a very real and a very visceral want and need to find and run to safety and to 
secure one's safety and to protect one's family and loved ones in any way that you can. I want us to honor that desire to protect each other. We need that love. We need that commitment. But I do want us to talk about how we do that. If we ourselves turn to guns as the answer, there is a New England Journal of Medical Research study that's done that shows where living in a home where there are guns increase the risk of suicide by 40 to 170 percent. Or I'm sorry, by homicide, for homicide by 40 to 170 percent. Um, increases the risk of suicide by 90 to 460 percent. The availability of guns is an issue. Now, I say this as a person who at that family farm in that cornfield after the run went and shot guns with my family and did target practice. And I say that as a um, person here who Bob took to the range. Um, and even though my arms are so short, I'm going to have to have a youth gun to keep doing this, which is really embarrassing. Um, there, is, there is fun and there is enjoyment and practicing and aiming. I'm not saying that we have to go to one extreme or the other in how we approach this issue. What I am asking is that we take the power that is given to us seriously and that we use it not only just like the money and gambling in a way that is responsible ourselves, but in a way that protects and helps increase responsibility in the system of it for others. For gambling, the United Methodist Church has meant that means we are called to not participate in that system at all. For guns, we haven't decided that yet and what that looks like. And we invite you to a conversation led by our bishop on Tuesday, October 17th, um, on how we approach this as United Methodists. And I'll send more information out um, as we continue forward. But what I do want us to wrestle with is our need for safety and security. Because as Christians, God hasn't called us to that goal of safety, of security. We serve a God who brought forth an enslaved people, but didn't bring them straight through the promised land. They went through a wilderness and knew hunger first. We follow a savior who gave his life, not in gun violence, but in the violence of torture of the Roman Empire of the cross. If we are to be true disciples, the Beatitudes call us to understand times of persecution and of violence as times where there can be blessing, as times where there can be gyms that train us for how to be followers of Christ. This is a really different narrative than the one that is in our world right now, and one that we need to seriously pray over and understand our call as Christians and our discipleship as we go up against all kinds of evil. Our call is not to safety. Our call is to building peace. And that means we will mourn. That means we will cry. That means we will be vulnerable. That means there will be times when we do not have what we would have had if we were in the mainstream call of consumerism and of self-protection. There is risk and it is real. Jesus died violently. Our entire early church is based on the martyrdom of our mothers and fathers who died as well. But what I would call us to is a peace that can be present when life is as it should be and when life is anything but. And my question for us is will we here at Epworth 
be the disciples whose roots are deep enough to support each other and to hold each other in a peace that goes beyond and has the strength to fight all of these forms of evil that we encounter. Will we be makers of peace? Will we be the helpers? In our discipleship commitment for this week, I'd like us to find some way to begin building ways that we remember and honor and are thankful for what we have to break the anxiety and those 3,000 messages a day that tell us we don't have enough. Ways that we can name the blessings that even if something horrible happened, we can find the helpers and name the blessings and the strength that was gained from that hard time and be thankful for it. And because violence will come and has come, what are ways that we can build relationships with our neighbors and our coworkers so that when this happens, and I say when and not if, here in Cockeysville, we have a foundation already in place to draw from that we don't have to scramble and build in the midst of a crisis when there's no time to do so. How do we do that relational work to know each other, to know each other's strengths, to know who will be able to respond best and what capacity and do that work seamlessly, organically together because we already know each other. And a part of that means we do our relational cleanup work along the way. So whatever fights, whatever grudges, whatever things are present in your family lives and in your friend lives that are breaking peace, start your training today and use those moments to strengthen you and to toughen you and to deepen your discipleship so that you will be ready when things get worse.